Okay, today is July 13th of 2015. Uh, we're at the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference in San Diego. We're here to uh, visit with Judge Terry Hatter in a brief oral history. My name is John Carson. I'm here on the Ninth Circuit on behalf of the Ninth Circuit Judicial Historical Society, and I'm informed that this interview will be preserved in our archives, someday probably made available. <laughs> Others, <yeah. laughs> and we'll provide you with a copy for your own use if I'm still around. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. you know, someone <laughs> will get a copy. <laughs> yeah, my grandkids. Right? So. Um, Judge Hatter, I've read your bio and uh, the many pages, but and I understand you were a third-generation lawyer. That's right, and my youngest son is a fourth-generation lawyer, and my oldest grandson is about to start Georgetown Law School in the fall after having just graduated from Williams College. Building a legacy. Yeah, yeah it goes on and on. Yeah. So your grandfather and your father were lawyers. What what made you well, decide? Well, no, my, uh, my mother and her father ah who had gone to law school, but he didn't, didn't practice. He was a uh, uh, auxiliary bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Sure. But my mother was a lawyer, and uh, her brother, and her brother-in-law, and uh, wow. her sister-in-law. So there were quite a few lawyers in the family to begin what with. What made you decide to follow in their footsteps, or was it always well, just actually, a given? Uh, I, if I had felt that I had the acumen to do anything other than law, I would have done it just to spite my mother, an only child and a, and a son at that. She, she never forgave me for not going into practice with her and um, actually rubbed salt in the wounds because I went into practice with an uncle back in Chicago and uh, she was not a happy camper. It was one of the reasons that actually ended up moving out to California. <laughs> yeah. Is that where you went to law school? I went to law school at home at the University of Chicago. Oh. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you didn't really sort of have a role model in your mother. Well, in a sense I did, and, um, and with these uncles and my Aunt Margaret, too, who practiced law until she was 92. But um, one of the first role models that I can recall was Judge Edith Sampson, who was one of the first uh, women of color to be a judge at any level in this country. She was a municipal court judge in uh, Chicago, and she was also an alternate delegate to the United Nations. Wow. And she was like a godmother to me and uh, actually gave me the furnishings from her husband's uh, practice when he passed away, Joe Clayton, who was one of the finest trial lawyers in the state of Illinois. And uh, I furnished my first law office with uh, his furnishings, and uh, included among them were five... Um, prints of, of, of former Supreme Court justices, and I still have them with me here some 60 years later. They're in my chambers. So, yeah, Edith Sampson really was a, a role model for me. That's quite a role yeah. model, isn't oh, yeah. it? <laughs> mm. And so you started practice law in Chicago. In Chicago with this uncle, and we had a small office uh, across from the old Chicago Stadium. And, of course, I was, <clears throat> by this time, quite active and the young Democrats of uh, Cook County worked with the real Mayor Daley, the <laughs> one that preceded the most recent Mayor Daley, and uh, the one who used to pick presidents yeah. like Kennedy and yeah. others. And I was vice chair of the young Democrats of Cook County, so I brought in a good bit of business as a result of that. And in those days, uh, you could also be um, in the public defender's office in Cook County, which was the largest county in the nation at the time. This was back in the very early 60s. The county was larger than uh, L.A. County at that time. And um, there were only about 15 to, to 20 deputy public defenders, uh, assistant public defenders, they called them, in that office. But we did over 50% of all the criminal business in the county. And uh, each one of us um, had a uh, courtroom assignment. I had my first murder case representing some uh, Native Americans who were charged with uh, uh, murder in a uh, tenement house uh, when it had gotten cold and they started a fire, not knowing that there was someone else in the place and the place caught on fire and all. Um, they were absolved, fortunately. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. It was hard work. I also did all of the juvenile work for the public defender's office. And in those days, back in the 60s, juveniles had even fewer rights than they have now, and they don't have the full, you know, yeah. Well, probably have rights that they ought to have, as you know. 
Uh, I would go over once a week um, or so to the one judge that handled juvenile matters in the county, a circuit judge, and just got on my knees and just uh, prayed to him to please be merciful, that sort of thing. So, um, and I always recall um, one of the um, people in the office um, who handled most of the appellate work was so overloaded that I used to try to help him too. He later became the uh, public defender for the county. And he was what you call a, a black Irishman. Uh, he was just an Irish Protestant. And um, I never forget, he was so busy and his Catholic priest was calling on the phone asking about one of his parishioners. And finally Jim said to him, he said, listen, Father, why don't you take care of his soul and I'll take care of his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten it. I mean, it's just such a great, great line. <laughs> so, so you were doing all this while you had your private practice Yeah, also. right, right. Oh, wow. I did. And then did it for two or three years. And then uh, talked with uh, Judge Sampson about uh, what she thought uh, my wife and I as uh, young people ought to do. We both came from very strong families, and we just sort of wanted to do it on our own. My wife's the oldest of five girls, and I'm an only. And she said, go west, young people, go west. And I had been west because I'd been in the military mm. right after graduating from Wesleyan University up in Connecticut, uh, trying to get it out of the way because the draft was going on. And... Um, mm ended up uh, actually serving in two branches of the government. Did my basic training down at Scott Air Force Base, I'm sorry, at, at uh, Jackson, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And I'd never prayed as much uh, in my life as I did in that period. And I'd grown up in this minister's uh, home and sat in the front pew every week, went to Sunday school and all, but I never prayed as much as when they told me I was going to South Carolina. I'd only been south once in my life with my father's older sister who had raised him. And I, I would just pray, God, please don't let him call me boy. Let me just get through this alive and all. And we got down there to Fort Jackson. I think there were about five of us who spoke English. Everyone else spoke Southern, and we couldn't understand the thing they were saying. And the first people I heard, I thought they were black. I turned around and know they were white Southerners. And he found that the white Southerners and black Southerners like the same food, same music, same kinds of things. I mean, it was just uh, really sort of an interesting experience. And it was right at the time that President uh, Truman had uh, integrated the, the services. And the first day there, they had barbers shaving the heads of the new recruits. And the white barbers would only shave the white recruits there, and the, and the colored barbers shaved everybody's hair. The white barber said, we don't know how to cut colored people's hair, and all they're doing is shaving it off. <laughs> and the only other distinction at that point was on, um, on Friday nights, they would bring girls from the other USC. I, I, I'd known about the University of Southern California because I had a good friend in Chicago whose sister had graduated from USC, but I didn't know about the University of South Carolina. And they would bring the little um, white co-eds up and they would dance. The band which was integrated uh, would play and, and the colored troops would stand around and watch. And then on Saturday night, they'd bring colored girls from Little Allen College, which was a uh, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church sponsored school, and they would reverse that, and the colored troops would dance, and the white troops would watch, and the integrated band would play. And I didn't dance. And there was a white female who must have been in her early 30s who was in charge of the entertainment and stuff, and she came over to me and she said, I noticed you're not dancing. I said, no, I'm not. She said, well, you're gonna dance with me. So I guess we integrated dancing down there too, you know. But as things turned out, when I finished my second eight weeks, I thought I was going to go to Europe. And I finished first in the clerk typist school, typing 25 words a minute, pecking away, and only one who could speak English, really. And um, I thought I was going to get a good assignment either in France or Germany. Everyone in front of me was going there. And I said, gee, this is something, because I'd given up the notion of getting a master's in public administration, either at the Fletcher School up at... Um, at Tufts or at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and then going to law school. So I said, well, I'll give up the master's part and just go on to law school after I get out of the military. <clears throat> and I had this two-year enlistment, and um, nobody would tell me when my name came up that I was going to California. And I said, where in the hell is California? I'd never been west of St. <laughs> Louis in my life. <laughs> and I really thought that <laughs> the world was flat in it. You just dropped <laughs> off after St. Louis. And the reason for that is, and most young people wouldn't even think about it, but there were 16 major league baseball teams, eight in the American League, eight in the National League. I knew the starting lineups in all 
16 of them. And St. Louis had two teams, the Browns and the Cardinals. And even Kansas City, which is now larger than St. Louis, was minor league. And then you would see television was just coming in, and you'd see these guys out in the Pacific Coast League, you know, the minor league, playing in shorts. And I said, you know, that's not really baseball. What, what is this? You know, what, California, what is this? But they gave me a ticket, and so I wouldn't have to be segregated on the trains. Uh, I also had a compartment and went on out to California to, to join the Air Force. I finally found a young lieutenant before I left who, who said to me, he said, well, you know, we have quotas in the military. We don't send Jews to certain parts of uh, the world because they're not accepted, and we have our quota for colors, he said, for, for Europe. And I like to think that out of things bad can come some things good, and sure enough, it did. I got then placed with the Air Force because the Air Force, <coughs> pardon me, started out as the old Army Air Corps during the Second World War when my father was fighting in Okinawa and my uncles were fighting in Germany and Italy. And my father would send me all these books. I knew not only the ranks and, um, and uniforms of the Allies, but also of the Axis powers and all. So I knew of the old Army Air Corps. And then when it spun off and became the um, a separate uh, branch, it took many years to build up the full capability and um, they would borrow from other branches, and particularly from the Army from which they'd been spun. And so I was with Skarwoff, and I've only met one person in my life since I got out in 1956 who'd ever heard of it. What it is was that? A special category of the Army with the Air Force. Uh -huh. And I was, they sent me out to Beale Air Force in northeastern California, Yuba City, Marysville. I actually fought the Battle of the Feather River <laughs> <laughs> during my time there. I go to San Francisco on the weekends, um, I was making $99 a month as a private first class. The Air Force pilots thought that the few of us from the Army were from some foreign Air Force. They were saluting us and all. It was really funny because we'd wear our battalion crests up on our <laughs> shoulders and all. They didn't know any different. And I was the battalion non-commissioned officer in charge of education. And all that meant was that I would lag in two copies of Look Magazine, two copies of Life, two copies of uh, Ebony. And I'd always keep one for myself because nobody else read. And then I'd loan money to guys because they'd be shooting craps. We got paid once a month. And they'd put a blanket over the billiards table and shoot crap. And I played ping pong. And there was only one guy on the base who was a better ping pong player. He was a young black fellow from, uh, it was a uh, high school teacher from Connecticut. And we had the best doubles team. And we were scheduled to go out to the Far East for the all-military finals. Wow. And when the major called some of us in and he said, um, we're gonna give you back to the Army now because uh, we've got our full complement. And then about a week later, he called us back again. He said, the Army's not gonna take you back <laughs> because of this easy Air Force living, I suppose. <laughs> and then a week later, he called us again. He said, someone went to the Congress and they passed legislation for the convenience of the government and you're being released six months early. So I, instead of doing two years, I did 18 months. And in those days, you got two years of the GI Bill for each day that you're in, so the three years covered books and things at least, and I lived within walking distance of the campus at the University of Chicago and met my wife at that time. She had come back from Wellesley and she had been at the lab school at the university and missed it and wanted to come back and finish and all. So um, then went there and then from there worked at the Veterans Administration while I was awaiting the results from the, from the uh, Illinois Bar and as soon as I passed the bar, actually turned out that I, I was at uh, a VA facility when I found out, out in the suburban area, Maywood, Illinois. And I'm still AWOL from um, the VA facility, uh, but I was so sick of seeing these guys from World War I and World War II with things in their throats and all, and, and nobody came to see me in the week that I was there. And once I found out I'd passed the bar, I said, well, the devil with this, and I just left and and then went in practice and uh, then later moved out to, to California on the advice of uh, Judge Sampson. We took a tour out, uh, found out that we were expecting for the first time we'd been married three years and hadn't had any kids at this time. Then all of a sudden, it's some bad planning on my wife's part as I keep telling her, <laughs> we had three kids the next 38 months. <laughs> then I had to pause at refreshes and four years later the little guy came along. So. Um, we had two girls and two boys, and now we, I tell people we believe in symmetry. We have two granddaughters and two grandsons, so we've been very fortunate. Ah, yeah. Wonderful. 
people might be interested in, I read a little bit about that Battle of Feather River. Would you, oh, yes. Would you I, care to describe I, that? That was very interesting. Uh, several of us, a number of us volunteered. That is, officers came around and found people hiding under bunks and in, <laughs> in closets and all. And meanwhile, they had sent all the townspeople from these twin towns of Yuba City and Marysville up to the base because it was on higher ground. They actually used to have a German POW camp there at, um, at Beale Air Force Base, too. And my job was to take an AK-47 and shoot at these giant pack rats. And I swear, they, they were more than a foot long. They were coming up out of the, the river delta while the other guys could sandbag. And I said, just out of self-defense, I was firing away, and it was the only time I'd fired <laughs> off of the firing range itself. And uh, a few months after that, the townspeople in the two towns uh, had a big celebration for us and a big barbecue. And the governor of the state then, Goodwin Knight, Goody Knight, uh -huh. brought an entourage of Hollywood stars there. And I'll never forget it because Susan Hayward, who was a real one of the bombshells in those days, kissed me on the cheek. And I've <laughs> never forgotten. And then some months later, after I'd gotten home, and I have this penchant for not going through mail and stuff for a while, and I come back home and and my mother finally saw this letter, it said U.S. Air Force, and I was afraid to open it because I thought they'd made a mistake and let me out early, and I'd already started law school, you know, and I said, oh, I'm not opening it. And she said, I'm gonna open it. She opened it, and she said, there's something in here, and it was a meritorious service badge for fighting the Battle of, uh, of the Feather River. <laughs> the pack rat. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, yeah, it was a great experience, I tell you. Yeah. So, and so then at some time, you uh, <laughs> were tapped for the bench? Well, that came up. A good bit later, because I came out to California after having an interview with Cecil Poole, who was one of the first two uh, African-American U.S. attorneys in the history of the country. Uh, Cecil, I think, was sworn in first, then uh, uh, a fellow in the Northern District of Ohio, uh, McCurdy, was sworn in. And um, so I, and Cecil offered me a job. And I wasn't sure that I would be able to pass the FBI background check, because I had been busted three times. <laughs> and once while still at Wesleyan, and um, in my senior year when I was leading a parade, uh, uh, sort of a counter parade to the VFW that was parading down Main Street in Middletown, Connecticut. And, um, and I remember at graduation a few weeks later, my mother coming up and raising hell with the police chief and the others and all. But the president of the university came over and had me out of there in, in a second, but I was very visible. I, I was the only black on campus my first year. They took in three others uh, my sophomore year, and one who later became the dean of the college. But uh, that was it for the four years I was at Wesleyan. So here I was, the only black student in my class and one of four on campus, leading this parade and wearing a maroon bathrobe with a um, Viking helmet and, and shield that I'd gotten from the fraternity house. I was the first like in a fraternity at Wesleyan, too. I wonder if they have any <laughs> photographs of that. <laughs> Somewhere around, but it made the New York Times and other kinds of things, you know, it, it was interesting. And then, when I was back home waiting to go in the military, um, I was driving and I was stopped by a cop who said I was doing 30 in a 25 mile zone or something, and I didn't have my license with me, and a friend of mine was with me, and I asked him to go and uh, get it from my stepdad, and um, while I was talking with him, this, policeman said, listen, uh, I'm talking to you now, and he, he punched me in the chest, and I punched him back and all, and he said, listen, boy. I said, listen, my father doesn't call me boy, and you're not man enough to do it. And he said, all right, you're under arrest, you know, for resisting. So he took me, and in Chicago in those days, uh, uh, in the different police uh, divisions, they would have a station, and they would move people around and all to keep them away from lawyers. Mm -hmm. And they had this one cell at the Hyde Park station near the University of Chicago. And I heard my mother when she got there, because my friend got to, to my stepdad, and he told my mother she came from downtown where she practiced in the loop. And they had me sign in a consent not to sue the city and other kinds of things. And then the third one came when I was in the military. Uh, I, was on temporary duty at Scott Air Force Base in Southern Illinois, which is very much like Mississippi, only without the signs, because you were supposed to know your place and um, uh, they didn't feel they needed signs. In fact, at one point, um, I went over to visit my aunt and uncle who were lawyers in St. Louis, and um, I stopped to get some food because I knew they were still in their office and I didn't want to bother them. 
and it was something like a, um, well, they didn't have that many fast food places in those days, but it was just a, a little diner, and there were no signs or anything, but I waited a while, and finally the guy came over to me and said, what you want? And I said, I'd like a chocolate milkshake and a hamburger, you know, well done. And then he started putting it in a bag after he got it. And I said, no, I'm having it here. He said, no, you ain't. He said, we don't serve your guy in here. And I'm in uniform, you know, about to be sent to Korea any day or anything else, you know. And I was so hurt by that that I just went and got on the train and went to Chicago just to talk to my mother about it. It was uh, one of the worst periods in, in my life. Um, so anyway, um, I um, did come out, uh, and FBI never asked me about any of the three arrests whatsoever. And they never asked me when I was um, being vetted for the district court, no. Because I, I think they were embarrassed about it all. You know, everyone was racially uh, tinged, you know. So anyway, I, I uh, spent some of the best years of my life um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco. In those days, there were only two districts, the northern and the southern. And the reason we have four districts now is that there were two judges in Sacramento, which was part of the old northern district. And I was the new kid on the block in the criminal division. And the guys would say to me, well, you live in Berkeley and you're closer to Sacramento than we are. And I said, well, I just looked at the map and I know you're in Marin and you're just as close. But uh, OK, I don't, I don't mind going. <laughs> and I'm not in anything like Phil Jackson used to be, you know, with the, you know, from the Lakers who talked about the cowbells and stuff. I mean, it was our state's capital and all, and I, I appreciate it. But every time I would go up there, Judge Halbert or Judge McBride would say, well, I see Mr. Poulos and another one of his big city boys up here to show us how to try a case. And I would just smile, and I said, no, Your Honor, I'm from the small town of Berkeley, and I've come to learn. So we got along uh, just great. <laughs> but we had one case. In those days, there, there was no public defender, and the no indigent defense panel. The judges would just look out there at some lawyer who uh, was there on a civil case said, you take the next criminal case. And the guy would wet his pants almost, yeah. I mean. And I do mean guys, because I remember one female practicing federal criminal defense work, uh, you know, at that time. And um, I had this one case involving Earl Warren Jr., who was picked. And it was a case, and I tell these young assistants now, it was a dire act. And they've never heard of the dire act. Just stolen cars across state lines. Then the car companies got smart and they let you take it anywhere, just pay for it, you know. So Earl Warren Jr. was representing them. And my wife, uh, some of her younger sisters would come out and say, we feel like pioneers. Three of the, of the four of them have moved to California since we did. And this one was a teenager. She's a, a doctor, now married to a doctor. Her daughter is about to become a doctor and all. But anyway, she was a teenager at the time, Tony. And she said, can I go with you this last day? Because sometimes I would just drive up and down. Other days I would stay up there for a you know, complicated matter. And so we went up after we had completed the matter and we were having the final arguments. And the judges only had one um, law clerk at that time. They had maybe a tenth of our calendars these days. And they had a bailiff. And so I forget whether it was Halbert or McBride. I think it was Halbert. And um, he finished, uh, you know, the and there were 11 men and one woman on the jury. Women didn't have to serve on juries back in the early 60s sure. if they didn't want to. And so they had these 12 ranchers and a rancher's wife. And Earl Warren Jr. came over and said uh, that he'd like to take my sister-in-law me to lunch. And we were talking about where to go. And there's a knock on the jury room door. And I said to the bailiff, I said, gee, they must want more instruction. He said, oh, that's the verdict. Two minutes. <laughs> and he said, it's got to take them some time to pick a foreman. I said, oh, my god. And who did they pick? The woman who's different uh -huh. from them. They didn't call her four person or four woman. She was the foreman. And they couldn't wait to get back out to the South 40 or whatever <laughs> and all. And it was guilty. Do. And I knew then that they needed to have their own district. Because if that had been in San Francisco, they would have come back with the same guilty verdict, but they would have gone to lunch at a very nice restaurant <laughs> first, then come back and announce their verdict. You know, So I knew they needed their own. They just didn't divide it up the right way. But Halbert and McBride could care less. They got their district away from San Francisco, and that was it. So um, I did that. And while I was doing that, I was also uh, helping some of my uh, uh, former classmates at the University of Chicago Law School who were helping set up legal services programs. Earl Johnson, whom you probably know, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, was a classmate and all, and he was the first deputy director nationally of the legal services program in the old Office of Economic Opportunity under Sarge Shriver. And then when 
uh, Clint Bamberger, who was the first uh, national director, left after a couple of years to go back to his firm in Baltimore. Earl became the second national uh, director, and he asked me to be the, well, before that, though, I had uh, helped uh, some of these people set up the San Francisco Neighborhood Legal Assistance Foundation, the Berkeley program, the Contra Costa program, and then they finally decided, well, maybe make a change. And I became the first chief counsel of the San Francisco Neighborhood Legal Assistance Foundation. And then at this time, after I'd done that a couple of years, Earl asked me to be the regional director for the Western region, which was the largest region. So I did, and I covered Guam, Micronesia, Samoa, Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, California. And then a year or so later, the Republicans came in, and uh, the attorney general from uh, Pennsylvania, I can't remember his name, Fred something or other, uh, asked me if I would be the deputy director. And I said, listen, my wife's giving me fits now. We've got four little kids, and I'm living out of this bag and all, and I don't see how I can do it. He said, well, if you just be the acting uh, deputy director for give me six months, get me on my feet and all. So I did that, you know, and was still the regional director. And then about this time, um, um, oh, what's his name, uh, left USC Law School which was one of the co-sponsors of the Western Center on Law and Poverty together with UCLA and Loyola. Um, uh, God, I can't, became the first uh, uh, minority law professor at, uh, at Harvard. And um, then SC started recruiting and they uh, urged me to um, consider it. So I, I, I actually um, then commuted for about six months between the Oakland airport and LAX and all, and fortunately my Dad and stepmom uh, had a building uh, in uh, Los Angeles where they intended to retire after uh, they left Chicago and opened. Meanwhile, my father had passed away, though. But so I had a place to stay, and then I would just do that. And finally, I brought my wife down and decided I would take the position. It also included being a clinical uh, law professor at, uh, at SC. And Dorothy Nelson was the dean at the time. She was the first female dean of a major law school. I was the only minority then on the faculty, and I was the faculty representative to the, um, uh, the law school's representative to the, the faculty senate of SC and other things. So I did that for a few years. I taught a constitutional law course. Um, Derek Bell, that's uh, who it was, and he left and went. And, um, and I took over the course that he had had in race, racism, and American law. And then later taught a course with uh, one of my present colleagues, now um, a magistrate judge, uh, um, uh, who um, I brought in to, to handle the, um, uh, oh, um, the school finance law case. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it and all, but it, it did make history because uh, education then became a fundamental interest under the California Constitution, if not under the U.S. Constitution. And um, um, then what? Um, and then I moved over and started teaching at uh, Loyola Law School, taught civil procedure and, and federal jurisdiction. And um, around this time, even before I'd left, Tom Bradley was a councilman and he came to the Western Center to ask for some help for some of his constituents. And by the time I was at Loyola, uh, he came and asked me if I would take a leave of absence and help him set up the city's first criminal justice planning office. So I did that and became a special uh, executive assistant to the mayor. And uh, anyone who works for Tom knows you can't do it part time or some other things. I finally resigned from teaching. And um, he asked me to be the director of urban development for the city. So I became a special assistant to the mayor at the level of a deputy mayor with a number of executive assistants under me and did that for a few years. And then went on the um, Superior Court, because Jerry Brown, who was in his first iteration as the youngest governor in the history of California, now in his second iteration as the oldest governor of California, mm -hmm. uh, was trying to get me out of the race for U.S. attorney. Uh -huh. And um, thought by giving me a judgeship, which I turned down the first time, and at this particular time I was on the board of um, MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and one of my neighbors and good friends uh, was the um, executive, well, she was the chief counsel and the CEO of it and all. And she happened to be on this, one of the first commissions that was set up under President Carter, who you probably don't recall, but in his one term, 
appointed more women and more minorities than in the history of our nation up to his one four-year term. Hmm. And other presidents have not been able to move away from that, even if they didn't want to do it. And the only people that have surpassed him have been um, Clinton, because he had two terms, and now this president uh, with two terms. And this president has appointed more Asian Americans than anyone else. And of course, he has a sister who's Asian. I'm sure that helped too and all. And um, so anyway, I um, talked to um, Vilma Martinez, um, who, when I was at a board meeting of MALDEF over in uh, Arizona, and um, and I told her that they were trying to get me out of the race. And all. she said, listen, why don't you take the judgeship? And she said, we'll still consider you. I said, oh, I didn't think that you would. And she said, sure. So I told, called uh, the governor's uh, judicial affairs secretary, whom I already knew, a um, guy named Tony Klein, who's uh, uh, on the DCA in uh, San Francisco. Um, I first met him when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. He came to introduce himself to me and said he was going to be marrying one of my sisters-in-law because they were all classmates at Yale Law School together, except my sister-in-law was far ahead of them. She was eighth in the class and on the journal and took Russian and piano to keep herself going because there wasn't much else going on at Yale Law School. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I called Tony Klein that, and told him that I was going to uh, go ahead and accept because he asked me over the weekend if I would think about it again. And I said, okay. And so I told him that I would do it, and, and I did. And interestingly, then um, the... Um, the senator, uh, the senior senator Cranston, um, picked someone else because oh. he was smart. He was caught between Mayor Bradley, who supported me, and the governor, who was supporting uh, Justice Mosk's son, uh. and because they owed a favor to Mosk. Because uh, I don't know if you remember, they passed over Mosk and put Rose Byrd in as the chief justice, uh. and things would have been entirely different. That they still would have made history by putting Rose on as an associate and elevating Mosk. They never could have attacked that court the way that they did yeah. and got rid of um, uh, two others at the same time, you know. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was really sad, but it, 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 it did occur, you know. So, anyway, I went to Superior Court, and one day uh, I was the um, supervising judge at uh, Eastlake uh, Juvenile Facility, and the bailiff said to me one morning, he says, there's a Sam Williams on the phone. And Sam Williams, as you probably remember, was um, the first black to be president of the county bar, the state bar, and was in line to be the first black to be president of the American bar. But and the, Supreme, the, the California Supreme Court. Yeah, right, and, and unfortunately had the stroke and died very early age and all. But President Carter had him as the chair of the Ninth Circuit uh, Commission that he put in place, and he had asked the senators in all the states to have commissions, you know, instead of the old white boys network that they had before that was pretty secretive and all. So uh, Vilma was on this commission and there were several other people that I knew. It was really a new day. And Sam Williams chaired all four of the commissions in the state. And the, the, anyway, the bailiff said, there's a Sam Williams on the phone. Do you want to take the call? I said, sure. And Sam said, um, and this was after, um, um, well, I, back up a bit. Um, Mayor Bradley was having, um, I think, his fourth re-election at the time, and the governor came with his entourage, including Gray Davis, who was his chief of staff at that time. And um, I went over the back door, because I was right there, 210 was Temple, and just went across and went in, because I knew everybody there. And the governor comes up and he says, uh, how are you enjoying the bench? I said, fine, governor. And Gray Davis pulls me aside and he says, listen, we have to talk. You're not, I said, what about? He said, you're not still supposed to be in that race for U.S. attorney. I said, really? <laughs> so I didn't stay to the end and I went back. And when I went back, there's an announcement on, on the radio. And I'd been evidently anointed by NBC TV and the L.A. Times as the number one choice for it. And he said that the senator was sending a name for it and it was uh, Andre Orton. The next day, I was sitting there on the bench, and the clerk said, Senator Cranston's on the phone. You want to take the call? I said, yes. So I asked the lawyers to please just wait. And I took the call, and the senator said, Terry, I think you know what happened. I said, I do, and I think you made a wise choice. I've known Andrea for years. She's going to be terrific. He said, well, hopefully there'll be some things we can work on together in the future. I said, thank you, Senator. It was less than two or three months later, that I got a call uh, when I came in again, and 
different bailiff, I think, and he said, there's a Sam Williams on the phone, you want to take the call? I said, sure. And Sam said, I just want to give you a heads up, Terry. He said, uh, there's going to be an announcement that Senator sent in the name for it. It'll be in the paper tomorrow. He said, but it's not you. And I said to myself, I said, why the devil is he telling me this? He said, but the next one's yours. Uh -huh. It was, Andre, it was uh, Marianna Felser who became the first female yeah, on the court. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, a few months later, there's a call from Cranston's chief of staff. And he said, can you meet with the senator in San Francisco? And it just, on Saturday, and I said, well, I'm going to be in San Francisco on Saturday because one of my many sisters-in-law was graduating from Boat Hall and um, Rose Bird was a commencement speaker. So I said, sure. So I met with him in the morning and he said, I just want to congratulate you personally and all and I'm sending your name for it. And then I went over to the graduation and all, and then came on. But everybody has a, a story. I didn't tell the full story about the governor, but... Um, did your name go straight through or were there problems? Well, that was interesting. Uh, Judge Nelson and uh, then Dean Nelson and I went through at the same time. And we were sailing along and all of a sudden we got a call that, uh, that to hold up. And we said, what's going on? And we couldn't figure out why. Someone said, well, it's uh, Senator Hayakawa, the, the, the junior senator. So she and I went back to talk to him. And I think somebody woke him up from his usual nap and all. And he didn't even know anything about it. But the guy that he had on the commission, because uh, uh -huh. the senior senator let him have uh, positions on there too. And none of these people who were on there were supposed to even apply for at least two years or so. But he wanted it. I forget the guy's name. He's an Italian-American lawyer downtown. And uh, he had managed to get the senator to put a hole on it, and the senator didn't even know that he had done it. Because the senator, after that, then came with Cranston to support the two of us. And it was really interesting. I was just telling someone about it earlier today. Um, we were back there for the hearing, and they called Judge Nelson, uh, Dean Nelson, and they called me, you know, Judge Hatter, because I was on the Superior Court. And I started up, and Strom Thurmond was one of the committee members. And his uh, <laughs> chief of staff came up to me, Duke Short, Duke something or other. And he said, Judge, he said, I got a few more questions for you. I said, yeah, <laughs> but I said, they're calling our name. He said, oh, he said, that, don't worry about that. It's going to take them a few minutes to get set up. And I said, well, okay. So we go over the side. He said, you remember the National Lawyers Guild, aren't you? And I said, no, I said, I only heard of it once. One of my professors at the University of Chicago, Malcolm Sharp, was one of the founders, but he never even talked about it. And then I started off, and he pulled me back again. He said, but you've got a lot of friends in that organization, don't you? <laughs> I said, not that I know of. So I finally went on. And years later, the um, National Lawyers Guild in L.A. gave me some award, and I recounted the story. And I said, yeah, now I can tell them I do have a lot of friends in the organization. <laughs> but that was, that was the only holdup. Wow. Uh, but, and, and even with that, you know, it was only a, a matter of, um, of a month or two. It was nothing like today. Oh, nothing yeah. Nothing like today. Yeah, it was horrible today. Yeah, and then I came on, and the very first case I drew was one that... Uh, should have gone to, well, it, it had been pulled by Harry Pregerson. And um, he uh, had just been elevated to the circuit, but he was still sitting there. But he had recused himself because it was supposedly the biggest mafia case uh, in the country at that time and um, involved extortion and uh, attempted murder. And they found uh, one of the capos of uh, the mafia um, dead in a pool of blood with three dimes in it in, in uh, San Diego. And uh, so they pulled in all the so-called mafia leaders from Vegas and, and from California. And I, I dubbed them the Over the Hill Gang because I'm from Chicago and I've seen the real mafia. And when these guys screwed up back there, they sent them out to California. <laughs> I mean, these guys were drawing Social Security and doing other stuff. And it was unbelievable. But it was quite a case, though. And this was before we had metal detectors in the court. And I ordered metal detectors for outside the courtroom. Uh. And one of the uh, defendant's son was representing him. You know that old adage, he who has himself for the lawyer yeah. is a fool for a client. It's even worse when you have a loved one as a client. And he was representing his dad together with someone else. And he was in tears. He was saying, please, judge, don't put those uh, metal detectors there. It, it really, it is, I've been all over the country at different uh, mafia trials, and there's never been a problem. And I said, Mr. Brickley, I said, you'll be able to say the same thing after this one because the metal detectors will be there. And we kept them there. And it, my first trial, and it was the only closed four dire I've done in 36 years, ah. was that first one. And I was sued by the LA Times and by uh, 
uh, several magazines and uh, TV stations, and to the benefit of one of my heroes who has now passed away, he was the then chief of the circuit, Jim Browning, called me and he said, Terry, how long do you think uh, this trial is going to last? I said, Chief, looks like it's going to be at least three months or more because we had six or seven defendants. He said, well, it's going to take us at least that long to decide this. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when they came down, they said that I should have issued uh, certain findings before doing it and all that. That's fine. But I knew good and well that the LA Times and others were going to do exactly what they did. They went to the spouses of these jurors and got all these things. And I don't care if it's a federal judge or who it was. If I'd known what this trial was about, I wouldn't have let my wife be on it. I wouldn't have let my husband, whatever, you know, all the kinds of things that I was trying to protect against. And I made the mistake that I try not to make anymore. The second day, I went out on the bench and I said, I don't understand why we have to have this conflict between the Sixth Amendment the right to a fair trial and the First Amendment right of the press and the media to know things. I said, you know, we got our system from Great Britain. And in a criminal trial, they can't release anything till the trial's over. The very next day, the lead editorial in the LA Times was, federal judge believes in un-American system. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said I will not make any more pronouncements like that from the bench. No, that was it. No more comments. No, not like that, no. So it, it's been interesting. I've had some interesting cases over the 36 years, including the, the very first uh, gay in the military case, uh, Keith Meinhold, who came out on the, the Today Show, uh, had the Clinton White House calling, uh, saying, we understand you've released mm -hmm. the opinion, can we have it? I said, sure, but unfortunately, the president went and tried to stare down Sam Nunn, who was the uh, uh, chair of the Senate Military Affairs Committee, and ended up with don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. He should have just left it with the courts, yeah. but you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And they've had uh, cases involving uh, uh, draft resistors, uh, particularly vocal ones and all, and, and that was interesting. Um, had the world's largest seizure of cocaine, 21 and a half tons, street value of $6.9 billion, uh, gave the people um, who were convicted life without the possibility of parole and was reversed. And I remember talking to Sam Nunn about it. Uh, I was on the board of the Rand Civil Justice Institute, and most people don't know, but Rand Institute uh, has a uh, public policy graduate program that's the largest in the nation. And none came out to be the commencement speaker. And I went up to talk to him afterwards, telling him about being reversed. And he said, he said I'm going to have hearings about that and all. So I, mm -hmm. I resentenced him, gave him life without the possibility of parole, and this time talked about all these young black and brown defendants I'd get every Monday who had marijuana convictions on the state side, then came over to the federal side and had enough crack cocaine to fit on the thumbnail, and they were getting life without the possibility of parole, and nobody said a word. But evidently, uh, the circuit said, well, the commission has never heard of this amount, you know, so you, how would you be able to use this amount for doing it? But they affirmed that time around, but it was an awful message uh, to yeah. have that go out yeah. and all. And I've had cases involving Dolly Parton and Jane Fonda on the, the movie Nine to Five, and, and Dolly Parton and had him eating out of her hand and all. I think that jury was out about two minutes too. She said they were charging him with stealing the music from nine to five. And she said, I'd never stolen from young people in my life. I've been supporting young people all over. And she played a guitar on the stand, you know, the whole thing. And all. <laughs> so it had been some wonderful moments. But then along came the sentencing guides, so-called guidelines. And I refer to them as so-called because I was one of about 10 judges from around the country who was called back to uh, look at them, and I didn't know that we were just supposed to anoint them. They had already made up their minds what they were going to do. And I said, at that time, I said, at least change the nomenclature. Don't call them guidelines. I said, I've been sentencing in the Superior Court, sentencing here, and it's the toughest job that I have, and I welcome any kind of help I can get. If they've good guidelines, that's fine, if they can help me. But these were, man these were mandates, yep. and we had you know, young prosecutors deciding what the sentence would be by the way they would charge the crime. And hell, I'd been a young prosecutor, so I knew that, you know. So it, it, it was tough those years, I must say. I got a lot of calls, even from prosecutors, uh, when Booker and some of the other Supreme Court uh, cases came down, finally giving us uh, back some amount of discretion. Yeah, it, it was an awful period, though. Yeah. And you may remember our court uh, had an en banc over at the, uh, in Pasadena at the Ninth Circuit, and we voted overwhelmingly that they were unconstitutional. And Ninth Circuit affirmed us, 
but then our case got tied to uh, Mastrata out of the Eighth Circuit in, in uh, Missouri, and then you had that usual 5-4 vote, and we were really worried because we didn't sentence on him for the two or three years that this was going through the courts. And we said, oh my God, we're gonna have to go back and resentence these people. Yeah. But fortunately, it was prospective, and uh, we didn't have to do that. Yeah. So, so you went from the daily machine inside to the <laughs> sentencing mafia guys on the outside. <laughs> oh yeah, I was on the school board back in uh, the Bay Area, and the now West Contra Costa District. It was the, uh, the Richmond Unified School. It was the eighth largest school district in the state. And we had the first teacher strike in the history of California. And I lost uh, union support because I wanted to keep the schools open. I said, you know, want these kids in school. And the uh, union didn't support me when I was up for re-election and all. But I, now I got, just, even if we have to have uh, arbitration, uh, binding or something else, but no. No, so I, yeah. Well, thank you, Terry. Uh, Judge Hatter, I appreciate all your time. You've been most generous and submitting all of your <laughs> background to us. <laughs> thank, <The> good. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.